Before we dive into this episode, I just wanted to take a moment to reflect on the two mass shootings that took place this weekend, one of which was an act of domestic terrorism inspired by white nationalism. Now is not the time for thoughts and prayers, but for action. You can call your senators and put pressure on them to pass the House bill that would improve gun regulations across the country. You can sign up to volunteer for a Senate campaign or donate to a Senate campaign so that Democrats have a chance at taking back the Senate and have the power to pass gun control regulations. And you can get on board with putting pressure on presidential candidates to remove the filibuster so that we can pass gun control and other laws and policies that would help the most vulnerable populations in this country. Moreover, and this is something that I think people that are white have trouble owning, but white toxic masculinity and white nationalism are intertwined. And we, especially the white males in this country, need to take ownership to ensure that we do everything possible to raise kids that are open-minded, caring, loving, emotionally vulnerable, and empathetic. We have to destroy the pillars of white nationalism in this country. And we also have to do what we can to raise white boys that aren't bottling up their anger, that aren't susceptible to hateful rhetoric, and that are accomplices in the work of creating a fair, equitable society for everyone. And with that, welcome to The Late Bell. If you want more honesty like what you just heard, subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Podcasts, and like the show on Facebook and Twitter at Late Bell Pod. Today we're talking about one of the biggest reasons for the inequality that exists in our educational systems, and one of the biggest levers that we could use to fight back against some of what we're seeing in our society today. And that lever is school funding. A conversation keeps coming up in the media, in political debates, in the minds of many Americans around what is possible in this country. Today, we're going to get into the weeds about school funding, how pervasive the challenges it creates are, how far families are willing to go to not give money to those not in their own circles, and how little has been done for decades. And so, before we get into that discussion, I just want to say this simply. If, for the last 50 years, the elites in this country wanted all of our schools to receive funding that enabled our students to thrive, regardless of zip code, it would have happened already. To radically invest in education would be to provide an opportunity for people who typically haven't been entitled to power since this country was founded, to finally obtain it, which would mean those in power currently being willing to sacrifice some of their own. Just because we haven't done it doesn't mean it's impossible to do it. America has funded expensive ventures and continues to fund expensive ventures in this country. Wars, tax cuts, and the like. So allow that understanding to frame the rest of the discussion you're about to hear with Sahaba Stadler, who's Ed Build's policy director. Ed Build is a wonderful nonprofit public policy organization looking to bring common sense and fairness to the school funding debate. And I am thrilled to have Zahaba on today. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, happy to be with you. Can you talk about Ed Build's mission and why it's so necessary to be talking effectively and with really strong strategy? about school funding. Yeah, absolutely. And and thanks so much for the kind words. I think that, look, anybody who's tried to do anything in a school, in a classroom, anybody who's tried to make anything better will tell you that it costs money. Mm-hmm. Um, but for too long, there's been this debate like, does money really matter? Is it really just about making the right investments? And that's a red herring because making sure that school districts have the funding that they're supposed to have and that that funding is enough to meet students' needs is states making the right investments. Mm -hmm. And there's a wealth of research out there that tells us that enough resources, especially for students in poverty, really does make the difference. It makes the difference for graduation rates, for achievement outcomes, for long-term life outcomes like employment and poverty rates as adults. All of that really matters. 
But the way our school funding system is structured now just isn't set up for those kids to succeed. And so it's really important to us at EdBuild to be talking about school funding and thinking about how is it unfair? How could it be made more just, more fair? How could we be thinking about it with the common sense approach of kids with greater needs need more? And so that's something that we really try to bring a data-driven and rigorous lens to. And I really appreciate that confidence with which your entire organization believes that to true and allows it to guide a lot of what you do. Because the second that we start having a conversation that starts off from the idea that schools that have students who have had greater rates of trauma in their lives, who have fewer supports outside of school. And we can go down that list of all the things that make certain schools need more supports, then naturally funding comes into play. And it wasn't until I started being in the classroom that I recognized that the way that we could use that funding, it isn't just about do you have the most, most updated textbooks and like some of these very antiquated ideas of where that money would go. But I've had conversations with some of our social workers and some other employees. And I've, you know, in this very um, utopian way, thought through like, what would it look like if we could hire the amount of social workers that we truly needed or any line of thinking that goes down any of those rabbit holes. So that kind of leads nicely into the way that Edbill talks about the funding systems that exist in the US. And the three words that are used to define, describe those funding systems are outdated, arbitrary, and segregated. And so I love those terms because it tells a very long, complex story in a very quick way. And so I'd love for you to talk about all of the, those terms and how each of them are true. Yeah, I think that what EdBuild likes to point to first and foremost, and we're really gratified to see that there's a consensus building around this problem over the last few years as we've been talking about it, is that the way we fund our schools starts with local property taxes, and that makes no sense, right? right? If, you, if you were just like, behind the veil of ignorance, if you were the Martian coming down to earth and you're like, what should determine the quality of a child's education? You're like, well, naturally, it should be the value of the homes in their parents' neighborhood. You would say, that is crazy. Like, where did we come up with this concept? How does that make any sense? Um, but we do begin there. In almost every state, the foundation of school funding is local property taxes. And what happens is that because we've got so much residential segregation by race and by wealth in this country, local property taxes, what, what it means to draw money from the local community means that you're going to see a ton of inequality on the ground. And so what we mean by arbitrary is that the money we're sending to school districts doesn't really bear any meaningful relationship to the needs of the kids in those districts. You could have the same kid with the same needs in one school district or another that's like 10 miles down the road, and they could be having a hugely disparate education. A hugely disparate set of resources are allocated to that student. And so that creates incentives for segregation, right? It comes out of segregation because class segregation means that there's different amounts of money in classrooms and neighboring communities. And it incentivizes more segregation because people with the means are always going to move to a school district that they see as the best schools for their kid. And so people with money are going to go to places that already have a lot of resources. And the fact that they want to be there means that property values go up. The fact that the property values are high means they can raise more money, which means those schools are going to have more resources. You just wind up with this vicious cycle of segregation and an arbitrariness that means kids aren't getting the resources that make sense for them. And so when we talk about outdated as a third problem, what we say is that, first of all, there are states that haven't reformed their funding formula in 50 years. I mean, that's true. You know, in Nevada, they're talking about reforming a funding formula that's been around since 1952. If you ask the folks in Delaware how old their funding formula is, they'll say, oh, it's post-World War II. Um, <laughs> A lot of that's things a real thing. World War II. Right. <laughs> yeah. But you don't say that about things that happened in 1980. No. Um, 
And exactly what you're saying, the notion that school funding problems are buying updated textbooks, that reflects a really outdated notion of what education funding is for, what a classroom looks like, what a student is doing all day, what a teacher is doing all day. And our funding systems are in many ways built for that outdated conception of education. And when we start thinking about what what you said is that it can it can be arbitrary and it always is arbitrary just based on the ground level of funding. But in addition to that, it can also be entirely counterintuitive because instead of if, again, a Martian came down and you said, well, the way that we fund our schools is schools that are in neighborhoods where property is lo- like less costly. We give those schools more funding because we assume that based on X, Y, and Z factors, those students need more supports. Is that still something that wouldn't necessarily be a great basis because of the way that the rest of our entire system works in terms of the housing markets and jobs and all of these other things? Yes, but at the very least in that one conversation with that one Martian, the Martian might say, okay, fine. But I also go back to something that Mike Johannick taught me when I was at Penn was this idea of being caught between the tension of individualistic focuses for education and communal focus. And a lot of what you're saying makes me recognize that our school funding made it so parents are forced to choose the individual option just because the way that that market is going to end up working it doesn't make sense to bet on just any community. You're going to end up picking a, sp- a spot where you are comfortable living so that your kid can get a good education and that if you can afford it. And so that makes it really hard for me being someone that believes that schools can strengthen communities. We've built a funding system that fights back against that pretty readily. Well, but you're talking about two layers of possibility. You said Mm -hmm. the individual and the communal. I'm going to challenge you to bump it up one more level and say the state. Yeah. It is the state in the United States that has the responsibility for providing schooling, right? We don't have a federal right to public education, but every one of the 50 states mentions public schooling. Right in its state constitution. It's the state's responsibility to ensure that every kid has access to a high quality education. And so putting the onus on parents, right? As you said, we're not gonna say, hey parent, it's your social responsibility to live in a school district that you don't think is as good, right? Like that's not a winning argument. But this shouldn't be a tug of war between individual parents and community leadership. This should be something that the state is doing to provide for all of its kids. But by starting with local property taxes, by starting the funding system with a really unequal basis, states are committing themselves to playing catch up. Right. That's what's happening, right? They're saying, okay, I'm gonna let huge inequalities open up at the local level and then I'm gonna try and fill in the gaps. But states just can't keep pace, right? Most states around the country are spending more on education than on any single other thing in their budget. They're doing their best in a lot of places, but they just can't keep pace with huge local inequalities because when you have the class divides that we have in this country, when you already have the residential segregation that we have on the ground, the disparities are just so big that states cannot possibly keep up. So the entire structure where states first let a chasm open up and then commit themselves to filling in the gap just isn't working. But it doesn't have to be that way, right? States actually legislate this whole thing into existence. And so if we stop taking it as a given that that needs to be step one, then they don't need to be failing at step two. They could be starting in a different way. And that's very true. And just how much we force states to play catch up or states have forced themselves. You're absolutely right. It was really driven home. Like the first book that I read after school ended this year was The Color of Law. And that all I was thinking about as I'm reading the way that policy has really dictated housing segregation for over a hundred years in this country. All I'm thinking about is that we still, even knowing all of that, and again, you, you are right that over time it is becoming, it's creeping closer to a majority of people saying like, yeah, that doesn't make sense. We still are enacting that. And states are still putting that as that base, which is pretty wild. And so 
I think it would be useful to dive into one of the case studies that your team has done. And if listeners want to go to the EdBuild website and take a look at a lot of the really, really incredible work, it's some of, it's some of my favorite um, data visualization that ends up happening in the ed sphere. It is some of my favorite work being done in terms of really articulating research. And so if people want to go and take a look at all these case studies, it would be great. But I'd love to hear about the work that your team did when looking at Memphis and what were some of the main things that you found when looking at what was going on in and around Memphis? Yeah, the Memphis story is a crazy story. And thanks for the shout out, by the way, to the EdBuild data team who handle all our uh, quantitative analysis and visuals. They are amazing. I'm more of on the words side of what we do. Um, but the Memphis story is something that we told in our report, which is called Fractured, um, on communities that are seceding from larger school districts. So we talk about local funding being a problem. What this report did is say, and when local funding is a problem, you have huge power if you get to redefine what local means, mm -hmm. right? If you get to draw a new border that says, this is my school district now, this is the school district where I'm paying taxes, it's going to be smaller, it's going to be around a wealthier community, maybe a whiter community, we're going to look after our own and define our own in the most narrow possible way. And that's really the Memphis story. It's nuts. So basically, most school districts in Tennessee, um, this is really common in the South, are county level school districts, right? Mm -hmm. By default, your school district is your county. Awesome. But for historical reasons, there's sort of a legacy that some cities have their own school district. So there was Memphis City School District and there was Shelby County School District. And back in the 70s, there was busing for desegregation. And that spurred this white flight, right? So white families started fleeing the Memphis City School District to live in Shelby County, um, which was sort of the suburban county school district surrounding Memphis. So over time, Memphis City School District became over 90% non-white. So we're talking real racial segregation in the Memphis area. But because the county school district is like the default thing in Tennessee, there were still some countywide taxes. Um, and so the people in the rest of Shelby County were still sort of pitching in financially somewhat for the Memphis City Schools. And then in 2008, the Shelby County School Board wanted to try and raise some money just for its own suburban schools. How could they raise some money and avoid sending it into Memphis? How could they keep it local in the way that they wanted to define local? Right. And they started pursuing this whole new status where the law would let them do that. And Memphis looked at this and they're like, oh, man, we are on the chopping block. We're not going to be able to survive if the suburban county school district starts to pull its funds away. And so Memphis said, well, by default, the county is the school district. What we're going to do is say, hey, we don't need a separate Memphis City School District. Shelby County can cover all of us. We can be one big happy school district. We can all attend schools in the same system, share all our tax dollars, share all our school buildings, it'll be great. So in, te in 2010, Memphis voted to dissolve its school district. So now there's one big county school district. Awesome. So what happens? Six really white, much wealthier suburbs looked around and said, this is not what we signed up for. And they through a whole bunch of back and forth and legislation and needing to change the laws and a huge mess, they got permission to pull away and form tiny school districts just for those six towns. So all of a sudden, the big happy family county school district is back to being pretty much only Memphis. And the wealthier communities now have pulled away and are having only their own school district. So the new school districts have a poverty rate lower than the Beverly Hills poverty rate. Wow. <laughs> like literally. Um, and the Memphis poverty rate is way up there. It's higher than Compton. Like. Every single breakaway district is richer and has higher value homes than the left behind school district that includes Memphis. And once they left it behind, they're like, you know, what? we're actually willing to pay higher taxes as long as those higher taxes are just for our kids. And so four out of those six breakaway towns actually raise their taxes That's after they left Memphis behind, because as long as it can go to build like literally a high school with three gymnasiums. <laughs> in one of those breakaway towns. It's totally fine. We just don't want to send it across town to Memphis. That is actually what happened. And so now Shelby County has seven school districts 
the county school district, quote unquote, which is just the needy kids in Memphis, pretty much, and six wealthier suburban districts. Which is wild. And it also makes me think if, like, in and around Philadelphia, if you looked at some of the wealth gaps that exist between some of the suburbans on the main line in Philly, and we have, we did a thought experiment where we made that one big county and then tried to do the same thing. And we could do we could play that game in and around any big city across the country. The likelihood that that would end up happening in some way, shape, or form, the actors might be different, the number of gymnasiums might be different, but the sheer audacity to try and manipulate that definite local is something that I think is innate to privileged communities. And it, it, it's it's a scary thing. And so I love to hear, just to kind of drive home the idea that this this wasn't just one weird place where everywhere else in the country is functioning fine and Memphis is the one place where this weird stuff is happening all the time. Could you give me your... I, I'm not going to use the word favorite, but the most memorable other example from the work that you've done about s- another crazy, audacious moment that you've seen um, from somewhere across the country of funding. Yeah, absolutely. I think that one example that I do like to point to is is a case study that we wrote about Midland, Pennsylvania. This was in a different report that you can check out on our website called Stranded. Um, It's a bit of a wonkier report, but here's the deal. There are times when students get left behind by their neighbors, right? But there are times when students just get left behind by the economy, right? We had a huge recession. It took states and districts a really long time to come out of it, and some of them never really did, right? So when we talk about the changing economy, Midland, Pennsylvania used to be a steel town in Western Pennsylvania, um, all the way out West Pennsylvania. It used to be a steel town and its steel mill closed in the early 80s, which is not an uncommon story through the Rust Belt. But what that meant is, well, no jobs in town, people starting to flee, the people that are left behind are the people who don't have the means to go anywhere. We're talking about a cycle of poverty, property values go down as it becomes an undesirable area. So you're looking at a school district in a spiral of decline and They were victims of circumstance, but they were victims of circumstance in the context of a policy that says, to a degree, you have to go it alone, right? There needs to be a base of local funding here. That's how we get started with school funding. And therefore, when the economy tanks, that school district doesn't really have anywhere to turn. But they tried. And this is what I think is really interesting. Midland said, we just don't have the revenue in our tiny town anymore to support these schools. But hey, we're part of this whole county. By 1983, that town had sent requests to every single other of the 14 school districts in Beaver County, Pennsylvania, to see if they wanted to merge. Like, we can't go it alone, but can you can you combine with us? We'll pool our taxes. We'll pool our kids. We'll, again, try something collaborative. And they were turned away over and over and over. And ultimately, they just didn't have the money to keep going. They had to close their high school. They were looking around to see who can take in these kids, right, if they're isn't a district that's willing to combine with us and we just don't have a high school like where are kids going to go to school from the mid 90s until 2015 they were sending kids literally over the state border into ohio to go to high school because that was the only district that would take them in and it's worth noting that east liverpool ohio also had fallen on hard times the reason they were willing to take them in is because hey if midland can pay a little bit of tuition then that can help out east liverpool not because anybody out of the goodness of their hearts, right? But that another struggling district saw benefit in maybe getting a few extra resources. But ultimately, when the economy has a downturn and the system is structured for you to rely on local money, you really don't have anywhere to turn. And when you reach out to those 14 other districts in your county and say, hey, want to take us on, the way the state has structured the funding system means, why should they? You don't have anything to bring to the table. You've got needy kids and no money, and they've got problems of their own. And so the only entity positioned to look at all kids and say, are their needs being met, is the state. Forcing one district to rely on the like benevolence of another school district in order to keep going, that doesn't make sense, but it is the system that the state has set up. And it's, it's harrowing when you start thinking about some of the economic signs that certain 
um, economists have been talking about and what ended up happening in terms of the housing bubble in 2008 and pairing that with like you you noted all along the rust belt all of these formerly um very um very industrial towns over time we have created like you said a system that it it may have failed a town like midland now but if we get hit harder again and we don't take changes to make sure that there is more onus to force collaboration and to be more willing to work as a state to pull some of those funds and to rework funding formulas and all of that, that the ramifications could be truly dire. Because when we have built a system of employment that is overly predicated on having a college degree, and then you're providing these small towns with no other option for their young students it's creating a cycle that will only get wider and more out of control if the economy um, goes into another downturn yeah i mean and it's not just you know Rust Belt towns, post-industrial locations, every place has its own unique challenges, right? right? You can talk about the economic challenges facing inner cities. You can talk about the economic challenges fo- fo- facing declining uh, industrial centers, but also about the economic challenges facing rural communities, yes. um, right? Everybody's got their unique challenge, and nobody's really that equipped to go it alone except for the, the most affluent. Um, and so what's important is to think about who's best positioned to lead this conversation? Who's best positioned to think about all of these kids? Because right now what we have is a political conversation that's really dominated um, by the affluent and the system's working okay for them. Um, But what that means is if you think about it, one big central city school district, which with lots of disadvantaged kids, lots of non-white students could be surrounded by a dozen tiny, wealthier school districts, right? I mean, there are, right, I'm from New Jersey, the poorest uh, city and school district in New Jersey, and in actually for a while in the country as a whole was Camden, New Jersey, yep. right? Camden's really struggling in a lot of ways, though they've they've worked really hard, but within a five-mile radius of the border of Camden, there are 30 other school districts. And I, I could, uh, so I, I'm from Philly, and I'm just, I'm going through all of the places that my brother was good at baseball and so all of the different townships that we would go to to play against and it until you just said that i never recognized just how truly wild that there are that many but if if you ride like paco from philly into jersey you magically go from philly to into the middle of camden And then 10 minutes later, you're in Haddonfield, you're in Cherry Hill, you're in these places where they can't, that a lot of people in those spaces wouldn't even be able to imagine what spending time in a Camden school would be like. And I don't think it should be so far-fetched to imagine the policy levers being pulled in different ways so that there was more equity. And maybe maybe I'm the crazy one for thinking that isn't an insane thought experiment. But my my hope is that there are there will only become more people that recognize that we have to just start doing the right thing, even if it's going to upset a lot of affluent parents. And we need to start figuring out a way to pitch it that will be politically sound, but also get these spaces that aren't receiving the funding they need, just getting those, all the the different things that they deserve in a high school experience. And so that kind of goes into the last question that I had for you really nicely, which is there are teachers and there are activists and that there are parents in some of these struggling districts that are listening to this now, thinking about funding generally. In your experience, what do you believe to be the best things that can be done 
by people that are active and willing to fight for um, more equitable funding. What are some of the things that those people? Yeah, I think it's really important. And it's also really hard because everything we've been talking about when you get down to the policy level is super wonky, right? All of this Mm -hmm. is really in the weeds, right? It's big, long funding equations that exist in super complicated and confusing state statutes. And I think a lot of people find it intimidating. Oh, that's not my conversation. It's got to be your conversation. And I think that's what's really important. So the reason I was talking about the size difference between school districts before, right, like the big Philadelphia's and the, and the like tiny mainline districts or big Camden and Little Haddonfield and Cherry Hill, mm-hmm. right, is because Every one of those districts has a voice, right? If a state legislator is like, who do I call to ask about this? Oh, I'll call the superintendents of the districts that are in my legislative district. Well, when you represent one big needy district and a lot of little affluent ones, you might have 10 superintendents to call, but nine of them have the interest in keeping the system the way it does, the way it is, right? right? And so if you think about the imbalance in the conversation, What you can do as an activist, as a teacher, as a parent, as a community member is think about how to shift the balance of voices. Because right now there are so many more people at the table representing those small affluent districts. Um, And how can you boost the voices of not just the big cities like Philadelphia, right, which have a voice at the table, but those like, you know, middle sized, like across the country not headline grabbing, but large systems that serve a lot of needy students. If you are a teacher, a community member, a parent in one of those systems, how do you boost the voice of that? And it's by showing up. It's by paying attention when these things are happening. Um, And it's by educating yourself about how your state currently does fund schools and how it falls short. Um, EdBuild has resources on its website that we hope will be helpful to people. We've got a database called Fund Ed that actually is just a a resource on how every single state, including yours, I promise, funds schools. Um, And you can say, does my state have funding for, let's say, special funding for low-income students? And the answer is, if you live in 42 states, yes. If you live in eight states, no. Maybe that's something you want to lobby about. Maybe that's something that you want to raise with your representative. Things like that really are available. Um, And when I say lobby, talk to your legislator. It's because every single thing we talk about here is a matter of state law. It's a matter of state law how schools are funded. It's a matter of state law whether and to what degree you're relying on local property taxes. It's also a matter of state law whether those communities around Memphis are allowed to do breakaway districts, right? How school district borders are drawn, that's governed by state law. And You don't need to know the fine print in order to know that something's happening in your community and there's something not right about it and the state could be working on it. Well, I love ending on positive messages. And I think that for anyone that wants to get involved, everything that you just said is motivating and it is something that is necessary for us to be working on over the next year, five years, 10 years to make sure that we can try and just work the baseline of these funding uh, formulas and these funding systems to make sure that there's more equity. And for anyone that wants more information, as you said, go to edbuild.org. There are so many incredible resources there. I love spending time on that site. It is eye-opening, and I promise that your eyes will be opened as well. And take the time out to read a lot of these case studies. They are told in ways that will make it digestible, that will make you ready to talk about this at the next dinner that you're at or anywhere that you talk about these issues. So Zahava, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much to Zahava for joining me on the podcast today. If you want to check out some of the work that her and the rest of her team have done, go to edbuild.org and take a look. If you love this week's episode, make sure that you share it in any way you can. And to make sure that you get next week's episode as soon as it is dropped, make sure you hit that subscribe button or whatever podcast app you use. That's all I got until then. Thank you so much for listening.